for years it was believed that Buddhism was pessimistic, that the Buddha talked about nothing but suffering, suffering, suffering. Fortunately, now more people realize that actually was talking about happiness. But in the common view of the Buddha's take on happiness, it's still pretty pessimistic. That causes and conditions are outside of our control, and we simply have to learn how to accept things as they are, and in that acceptance find some measure of happiness. But that's not how the Buddha taught about happiness at all. What that describes is more equanimity, but not necessarily a good kind of equanimity, more resignation. When the Buddha talked about happiness, he talked about ultimate happiness. And he never said that things are outside of your control. In fact, the whole path is learning how to take control of your life. So it's able to achieve a happiness that's worth all the effort that goes into it. The basic question that lies at the foundation of wisdom, he said, was, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? And right there, there's the issue of doing is important. That's the beginning of the wisdom, realizing there are things you can do. But even beyond that, there are the answers that the Buddha gave. The first list of answers has to do with the practice of merit, being generous, being virtuous, and developing a mind of unlimited goodwill. These are things that you do, and you change your life as a result. You're not just accepting conditions, you're changing the conditions. You can say that you're taking the reins of your life, or you're taking your life by the horns and turning it in a good direction. Because the happiness that comes from these activities is not only good for you, but it's totally harmless. And it's good for other people. It teaches you a valuable lesson that happiness doesn't necessarily have to be selfish, and it doesn't have to depend on you're gaining and other people losing. You engage in these three activities and you gain and other people gain as well. And as you engage in them, you gain a sense of the freedom of choice you have to change your life and change it for the better, to find a happiness that really is long term. For instance, with generosity. The Buddha always protected the idea that generosity should be voluntary. He never gave Donna talks in the way they're given now. He never tried to put a squeeze on people or demand that they give to Buddhists. A king once came to the Buddha and asked him, where should a gift be given? And he was used to hearing the Brahmins saying that gifts should be given to Brahmins, and the Jains saying that gifts should be given to Jains. So he probably expected the Buddha to say, well, give to the Buddhists. But that's not what the Buddha said. He said, give where you feel inspired, where you feel the gift would be well used. In fact, that's a rule for the monks up to this day. When someone comes and says, where should we give a gift? You say, give where you feel inspired. You feel your gift would be well used or well taken care of. It throws the responsibility of the gift back on the donor, but it also reminds the donor that this is an act of freedom. And this is what freedom really means, not that you simply follow your moods, but you want to do something that's good for others at the same time, that it feels good doing it. And the gift here can be not only material things, but also the gift of your time the gift of your knowledge, the gift of your strength, the gift of forgiveness. All of these things count as generosity. And they teach you a lesson. If you want to gain some happiness out of life, you have to be willing to give first. 
this lesson, of course, then carries on into the meditation. Before thinking about what you're going to gain out of the meditation, you first has to have to ask, what are you going to give? You give of your time. Again, you give of your energy. You give your full attention. And you give up the mind's desire to go wandering around wherever it likes. Building on generosity is, is also virtue, which is also a gift. As the Buddha said, when you make a vow and carry it through, that you're not going to harm anybody, you're not going to kill, steal, have illicit sex, lie, take intoxicants. And you stick with that in all situations. Then you're giving universal safety. Doesn't mean you're protecting everybody from from bad things, but from your quarter there is no danger. When you can give universal safety like that, you get a share in that universal safety too. And the sense of well-being that comes with that. That there are things you might have done that would have been harmful, but you were above that. That's a genuine sense of self-esteem. So again, you gain, and other people gain protection, gain safety. So it's a good happiness. It's not the same as a pleasure at the senses of something, a nice nice sight, nice smell, nice sound, nice taste, nice tactile sensation. Those things come and then they go. And the memory of them can sometimes burn, even if the sensation was nice, but the memory can burn. But the memory of being generous is always a good memory. It feels good. In fact, as the Buddha likes to say, generosity is good as you plan to do it, good while you do it, good after you do it. The same with virtue. Make up your mind you're going to observe the precepts, and then you actually do it, and then you reflect back on it. It's happiness all the way through, before, during, after, past, present, future. It doesn't go sour, it doesn't go rotten unlike the ordinary pleasures of the world. And building on the practice of generosity and virtue, then when you develop the meditation of goodwill, it's not hypocritical. It's simply an extension of what you're already doing. You're spreading it out more in all directions. Realizing if you want to be able to trust your virtue, you have to be able to trust yourself not to have ill will for anyone, not to wish them harm. Now, this doesn't mean simply wishing that they be happy whatever they do. As the Buddha explains, the causes for happiness, they come from actions. So you're wishing, may this person, may all beings, understand the causes of true happiness and be willing and able to act on them. That's something you can wish for even the most vile people. Which is why goodwill can be universal. And again, you give. There are cases where people may have wronged you in the past, or wronged your family, wronged your friends. But you're not going to let that be an obstacle to your goodwill. You're going to give up the desire for revenge. There's a story in the canon where the young prince, as his parents taken away from him, they're executed, king and a queen, by the king of another kingdom. And he vows vengeance. And he works his way. He goes to the king's palace, starts working in the elephant stables, playing the flute. I think it's a nice touch, playing flutes for elephants. But the sound of the flute goes throughout the palace, and the king says he really knows how to play the flute. So he wants him in his chamber, playing the flute at night. And then eventually he becomes a servant to the king, and becomes a trusted servant. And one day he's in a position where he could kill the king. But he doesn't, because before his father died he said to him, Don't look too far, don't look too close. This animosity is not 
ended by animosity, it's ended by lack of animosity. So he decides not to kill the king. This is after threatening the king. So in both cases, the king says, you know, I beg my life of you, and the, uh, the young prince says, no, I beg my life of you. So they decide that each is going to swear off vengeance. The Buddha tells this story. He says he was that prince in a previous lifetime, and he tells it to a group of monks, saying if even if kings who live by violence can swear off the desire for revenge, we as practicing Buddhists should be able to do that too. So you don't let past wrongs get in the way of your goodwill. Because if you have ill will for someone, you can't trust yourself that you're going to behave skillfully around that person, and that's then going to become your karma. So the thoughts of goodwill are nourishment for your generosity and nourishment for your virtue. The Buddha also calls them a kind of restraint. Again, the, the encouragement that if you have goodwill for someone, you, it will restrain you from harming them. He says it's a resolution and it's a form of mindfulness. It's something we have to keep in mind, because goodwill is something we have usually for some people, but not for everyone. And it's an act of will that you remember, which is what mindfulness means. You, you remember that you're going to have goodwill for everybody, even the worst people. You don't have to like them, you don't have to hang around them, but you're not going to harm them. You wish them well. This too is a form of happiness. When you can look at your mind and say, there's nobody that I have any ill will for, it makes the mind more expansive. This can actually protect you from some of your past bad actions, in the sense that the results come from from your past bad actions, but they don't have that big an impact on the mind, because the mind is so much bigger. All these forms of merit, generosity, virtue, universal goodwill, enlarge the mind. Make it a roomier mind to live in. Because as your happiness doesn't create boundaries, it can spread around. And there's a sense of happiness in common that allows it to be large. At the same time, you've taken control of your life. You've taken your life by the horns and moved it in a really good direction, a direction that you could be proud of and happy with. So when the Buddha is talking about happiness, it's not simply acceptance that things are beyond your control. It's the realization that certain things are within your control. You can turn those things to a really good and noble kind of happiness. The happiness that prepares you for, for your concentration practice and for discernment practice. It's nothing to be looked down on, the practice of merit. It's the foundation for everything else and that quality of goodness that comes with your happiness will permeate the rest of your practice as well and make sure that it stays on course. <laughs>